good afternoon or good morning as the case may be wherever you are. And welcome to the 19th CVMA Town Hall series on navigating through COVID-19. I'm Louis Quantas, president of the CVMA and here to introduce today's webinar. Only about a month ago at our last town hall, we were talking about the possible influence this new variant Omicron might have. Since then, we've seen some unpleasant predictions come true. So our town hall series continues on an as needed basis. Hopefully we can hear some good news today, but we do need to hear whatever the best and most up-to-date information is. And so I'm happy to be able to introduce Dr. Scott Weiss again, who has been reliably available with provision of expert information and advice for veterinarians in Canada. I keep saying that Dr. Scott Weiss hardly needs an introduction, and that's true for most of us, but in case there are new visitors with us today, he is a veterinary internist and microbiologist, a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine, a professor at the Ontario Veterinary College and a zoonotic disease public health microbiologist at the University of Guelph Center for Public Health and Zoonosis. He's also a chief of infection control um, at the OVC Teaching Hospital, holds a Canada Research Chair in Zoonotic Diseases, hosts a popular Worms and Germs blog, and is a recipient of the first ever CVMA Outstanding Achievement Award. I would like to ask, please, each of you, other than Scott, to keep yourself muted with video turned off for the best online experience. If you have questions as we go along, feel free to type them in the chat box for Scott to answer when they pop up or at the end of the presentation. Dr. Weiss has indicated he will take some time, extra time if needed to answer questions at the end of his presentation. And so thank you for that, Dr. Weiss, and please take it from here. Great, thanks a lot, Louis. Uh, let's pull some slides here. I don't have a lot of slides today. Um, really wanted to kind of answer the questions that you want addressed. So um, feel free to start, as Lisa I toss them in the chat, we'll try to get through them all. And I think, you know, the last one, if you're on, was probably a fairly pessimistic one because, you know, we could see some badness on the horizon with Omicron. And, you know, we were right, unfortunately. Hopefully we're starting to see the potential of the back end of this wave. So I'm not going to talk a lot about the basics of Omicron. We've gone over that. We've all heard of that in the media and elsewhere. I'm going to talk about a couple issues, a little bit about Omicron and vaccination, a little bit about therapeutics, just so you have the background on that. Uh, more on rapid tests. We've had on rapid tests quite a few times, and our understanding of rapid tests is evolving with Omicron. And I think our understanding of rapid test is maybe devolving to some degree. It's, it's getting worse. We don't really know how to use rapid tests as effectively now. In an era where we don't have as many and where Omicron has changed the, the performance of these tests potentially. So I'll get into that because they're, they're still useful but we have to think about what they're used for and how we use them, especially if we have limited numbers of them. So Omicron obviously is the big thing that's hanging over us right now. Uh, the majority, you know, almost all infections right now in Canada are presumably Omicron. Uh, different areas or different states of the epidemiology of this. This is Ontario hospitalizations, uh, or sorry, ICU stays. You'd see, you know, last time we talked, we were saying, okay, Omicron's hit. We're gonna see cases coming up. We need to see what happens to hospitalizations and ICU stays. And we were worried about it flying up and it did. So even though this variant itself is inherently less virulent than Delta, because it's so much more transmissible and we see so many more cases that gets reflected in healthcare burdens. So what we're hoping is just the last couple of days, we're maybe getting a signal that we're starting to slow down or plateau. So we're kind of hoping we may plateau around the 600 level with this and then start to see the back end. In Ontario, we're going on the assumption that, you know, in this week or so, we're starting to see the plateau in actual cases. We're flying a bit blind because of decreased testing, but suspicion is uh, we're seeing a plateau based on a few different indicators, including wastewater testing, uh, which can be a reasonable proxy when we do less human testing. So I think we're starting to see in most areas, the, the horizon for this wave starting to, to drop. And it's not going to go back to normal immediately. It takes time for all this to happen. We still have a lot of transmission. But as we have more and more people that have been affected, more and more people that have third doses, then we are going to see more population protection. So we're in a better place than we were in terms of what the next two or three weeks are going to hold than we were back in December, when December we knew things were ramping up. It was just how bad it's going to be. Now I think we're on the assumption that things will hopefully stabilize and start to ramp down in the near future. And in some places, it'll be a few weeks shifted one way or the other on this. Are you still ramping up or are you ahead of us ramping down? 
But you know, I'm a little more optimistic from that standpoint right now. Key thing really, and this gets into what we do in clinics in terms of vaccination requirements for staff, or you think about people coming into the clinic, vaccines work. You have to remember what they're used for, right? Vaccines are okay for prevention of infection. We'll come a little bit more on that in a minute. They're very good for prevention of severe disease and they're really, really good at prevention of serious outcomes. So ICU stays and death. Um, you know, the evidence of efficacy of the vaccine itself for preventing infection is dropping based on Omicron, based on waning immunity after second doses, but it's still doing a very good job of keeping people at a hospital. Even with two doses and waning immunity, we're still seeing very good protection from serious disease. And it shows this a bit. This is protection, uh, looking at protection over time uh, from hospitalization, which is the yellow one, ICU stay on top, and then just actual infection, this purplish line. And you can see over time, we've got a big drop in the protection from actual infection, just any type of infection. And there are two things that come into there. One is waning immunity, because a lot of people got vaccinated spring summer, and this is before a lot of third doses. The other is the Omicron effect. So this virus is a challenge for vaccination for prevention of infection. And there are a couple of reasons for that potentially. It's behaving a lot more like an upper respiratory tract virus than a lower respiratory tract virus. It's a bit harder to protect against those. And as, as humoral immunity wanes, we still have very good cell mediated immunity, but it takes a little bit of time for that to ramp up. So if we're getting exposed in the upper respiratory tract and we're relying on cell mediated immunity, you're gonna get infected and the CMI is gonna kick in a little bit later and prevent that infection from causing big problems, but you're still gonna get infected. Now, if we look at this graph, if you said, if you ignore the two vaccine doses, you said protection against infection, hospitalization, or ICU stay, ignoring number of doses, it would track very similarly. But what you'd see now is a curve that's coming up again because of the third dose effect. So that third dose of vaccine does restore a lot of the protection against actual infection of any sort and will give a boost in the protection against severe disease uh, and hospitalization, which is already still quite high with this vaccine. So the take home there, um, vaccinations is obviously still critical for this. Three doses is absolutely critical. Full vaccination needs to be considered to be three doses. We go to four doses would be the question. Four do fourth doses are being given in high-risk individuals, so long-term care residents, immunocompromised uh, patients, and people that are you know high risk for severe outcomes. I think we've got someone that's unmuted there. So high risk for severe outcomes uh, or high risk for not responding very well to the vaccine. But really, if we're starting to think we want everyone to be fully vaccinated when they're coming into a clinic, fully vaccinated really should mean three doses now. And again, I'll keep an eye on the chat as we go through. So toss, toss questions in there. Um, antiviral. So there's been a lot of talk this week about, about Paxlovid, uh, Pfizer's new drug. It's a combination drug. It's a protease inhibitor. Really good drug. Oral drug, high efficacy when used kind of early to prevent progression to severe disease. Just approved in Canada, we don't have much of it. So this is not something where you can say, okay, I don't need to worry about it anymore. If I start to feel crappy, I'm going to go and get a, get a pill. Well, you might be able to, but it's going to be a fairly limited population that's going to have access to this just because we don't have a lot of it. You know, it's less effective than vaccination because you have to get sick and you have to get it before you get very sick and it has to work. So it's a good treatment. It's a really good treatment for people that are high risk for complications and people that are unvaccinated or it's poor, poor ability to respond to vaccination. And the messaging concern here isn't, well, you don't need to get vaccinated because you got Paxlovid, right? And you know that's a bit of a concerning message. I can hold off and not get vaccinated because I can get a drug. And it's just a reminder is odds are you won't get that drug, you know, at least right now. Vaccination is still what we need to do. But this is going to be a great addition. Um, and I'll, sh I'll show some recommendations on, on how it might be rolled out in some different areas. Uh, Molnupiravir, this is Merck's drug. You know, this has really been underwhelming. Um, there are a couple issues with it. It's not as efficacious as Paxlovid by far. It's not as efficacious as the initial press release said. Their broader study showed a decrease in, in, in uh, response compared to what they had initially. We have the ability to get some. Uh, we don't have it approved yet in Canada, but once it's approved, if it's approved, there's already an agreement to buy a crap load of it. There is a bit of concern about whether it'll drive mutate. So Paxlovid is a protease inhibitor, so it's typically antiviral. Uh, Molnupiravir induces 
genetic modifications. It makes the virus mutate, and which typically is going to induce a fatal mutation. There's some concern that that could induce clinically relevant mutations. We really don't know. It's not a, it's not a deal breaker for this drug, uh, but Paxlovid is going to be the one that we have the most interest in based on efficacy, based on oral route, probably based on, you know, a theoretical lower risk of a problem developing. Remdesivir is still around, parenteral. It's useful in select populations. You know, it's a, it's a bit of a craptastic drug. Uh, there's some data that just came up from Canada looking at remdesivir, and it was basically a meh response. There was a statistically significant improvement um, in people that got remdesivir, but it was modest. It was how it was described. So if you, you know, if you're high risk, you want this drug. Right? There's not a major contraindication to it, but it's not the drug that's going to get us out of this pandemic because the impact is is not great. Better than nothing, but it's not great, and it's parenteral and it's expensive. So if you're curious about these, this is a pretty hard slide to read. This is from the Ontario Science Table. This is a most recent document from, I think this was just yesterday, the most recent version came out. And this gives you an idea of how some of these drugs are used. Uh, so for critically ill patients, you know, DEX is still the standard, great old drug, works really well. Tocilizumab, which we have problems accessing. A lot of our drugs right now, we're having a hard time keeping up with demand. Tocilizumab um, is certainly one of them that's really important drug in severely ill people. And it's shortages are, are certainly an issue here. So when they look at the recommendations for different groups, part of it is does it work? Part of it is are we gonna use it in that population because we don't have a lot of it around. So if you want, um, you can look up the science table and see this recommendation, or we can put these slides available. So severe patients, moderately ill patients. The one I want to talk about a little bit more is the mildly ill patients. So the community treatment, which you start bringing in, okay, where's Paxlovid fit in here? Uh, so Trovimab is a really effective drug for high-risk people, um, but there's not a lot of it. So this is used for people that are unvaccinated or had poor vaccine response, and it's in very short supply. So you can see some of these drugs could be effective in lower risk people, but we're not going to use them because we don't have a lot of it. So our highest risk populations, and this is who's going to get Paxlovid probably preferentially, is going to be immunocompromised people that didn't respond well to vaccination, unvaccinated people that are at the highest risk of severe disease based on their age, based on their comorbidities. Then you start dropping down, you know, unvaccinated people that are lower risk. They're still higher risk than average, but they're not the highest risk population. And then down to the general population. And the general population is not gonna have most of these drugs recommended because we don't have enough of it to give to thousands upon thousands of people. They really need to be conserved for those highest risk people that are more likely to progress to severe disease and hospitalization. Okay, um, I'll just touch on this quickly and then I'll see, catch up on the questions here. So that was just kind of where we are with some of the human stuff. I'm happy to chat more about that after. A uh, couple new things on the animal side. Uh, the most notable one probably is deer. So since the last time we talked, there've been uh, identification of affected deer in Saskatchewan and just in Ontario as a report from yesterday. Completely unsurprising. Um, we've known from the U.S. that deer infection seems to be fairly easy to happen one way or the other. And the U.S. has shown fairly high infection rates in deer populations in different parts of the country. In Canada, it wasn't surprising to find the same thing. We don't have as much surveillance. We haven't seen as much of it compared to the U.S., uh, whether it's just based on how the testing is being done, where and when, or whether there's a true difference, we don't know. But it's pretty clear this virus gets into the deer population. What happens after that is the big question. And how does it get there is the other question. You know, I do talks like this and I say, well, I'm not really sure how it gets there because we don't tend to have a lot of close contact with deer. Then I get pictures, you know, the deer ringing the doorbell and the fawn laying on the step, the people hand feeding deer. Some people in urban parks uh, where you've got a big deer population in uh, Montreal, for example, where some of these are very tame. And then this, this is one I've seen a lot of pictures like this where you got the cat hanging out with the fawn. And, you know, considering how susceptible cats are, are cats an intermediate host? Or an in, indoor, outdoor cats getting infected by people and then spreading it to wildlife? So we've got a whole range of possible ways that we're getting this into deer, but it's pretty clear we have had multiple incursions into deer. And the big question is, does it stay in deer? Because if it stays in deer, then we create the potential for a reservoir which means it circulates around the deer population. And as we control it in people, we've still got it in animals. And if it's circulating around the deer population, we have a couple other concerns. One is they're exposing other animals 
which we don't know as much about susceptibility. And the bigger concern is variance. The more transmission, transmission over time, the greater chance you get a variant emergence. And if that's clinically relevant for us, so if we get a deer variant that can still infect us, but maybe it doesn't respond as well to our antibody-based therapies or vaccination, or it's more transmissible or more severe, then that's a clinically relevant situation. And you get into somewhat of an analog of influenza that's out there in nature and different strains can come back in. We don't know if that's gonna happen. Basically we need to see over time, see what strains are there. If the strains we see in deer continue to be the same strains we find in people at that place in that time, probably suggests we're just doing short-term transmission, goes in the deer and it burns out. But if we start seeing legacy strains, older strains, or strains that start to deviate from what we see in people, then we get more concerned. And one thing to think about the animal side is like right now, this is a human driven pandemic, right? Human human transmission is rampant. It's screaming through the human population, which means kind of two things. One, it means we've got a lot of chance for exposure of animals, but the other is the risk of animals causing a problem for us is probably pretty low, right? Because I can infect dogs and cats and deer and whatever, but I'm much, much more likely right now to get infected from a person. So we may be creating scenarios for transmission from animals that aren't really relevant to us right now or highly relevant to us right now because we've got so much human transmission. But paradoxically, as we start to control this in people, if we control in people internationally, if we vaccinate the world, where you end up is a switch situation, maybe where the biggest pool of susceptible unvaccinated individuals is wildlife. So maybe the risk then starts to shift as we control it in people, the animal side might be more relevant. So I'm not, I'm not trying to, to freak people out about deer or the animal side, but it's why we're paying attention. I'm not worried about deer causing a problem in the epidemiology right now. What I'm more worried about is complicating things down the road once we get to a controlled state. And what we wanted to do is we've been saying this all the way along is keep this as a human virus. So we don't have to worry about you know, animal aspects but obviously it's sneaking into different animal populations. And one more animal story you may have heard from yesterday, um, big overreaction in Hong Kong. So Hong Kong is a COVID zero approach. They have a very strict approach, but they're starting to see community transmission now. And the story here was there was a pet store worker who was identified uh, with COVID. And there was also someone else that went into that store around the same time was identified with COVID. And the daughter of that person who went into the store handled a hamster. So they went in and decided to test the animals, and, and I, which I think is fine, right? That's how we learn more about it. We understand this human animal dynamic, we identify problems. And they found uh, testing a lot of different animals, 11 infected hamsters, and no infected other species, chinchillas and things like that. And it's good information to know, but the problem is the reaction. The reaction has been to euthanize or plan to euthanize a couple thousand small mammals. They've also set up a hamster hotline where anyone that bought a hamster after December 22nd is supposed to call in so they can kill the hamster. Um, you know, and if you ado adopted a hamster in December, like there's not any chance it's infectious right now. Hamsters like us, and like other species, have a fairly short and relatively well-defined shedding time. They get infected, they shed the virus for a short period of time, and they get over it. So this is always the balance, right? We try to talk about the, the issues of animals, the importance of paying attention to animals, but try not to get people to do stupid things and overreact. Because the easiest thing to do to control an animal problem is what? It's kill the animal. Not the best thing to do for the animal, obviously, or for the owner when they're taking hamsters from kids and, and euthanizing them. And not best for our understanding either, because we're at an opportunity to actually do more testing and, and see what happens, isolate them. Hamsters are easy to isolate. You know, it's not, dirty easy other things we have to think about and protection and everything so i don't want to downplay it but this is the problem we run into when we're talking about animal sites right we have to get some awareness there but at the same time we have to talk people off the ledge and get them from overreacting and personally i would consider that a, a gross overreaction okay uh, i'm just gonna pop into the chat and then we'll get into some of the testing and rapid test issues um are they doing titers and then determining if a fourth dose is needed? Titers aren't really the, the mainstay of looking at this. A lot of this is the epidemiology. And titers are part of it when you're trying to see at the population level. Titers don't get at your cell mediated immunity, which is probably playing a major role here. So the fourth doses are really being prioritized for people that are at high risk of severe outcomes and at high risk for just not having a great immune response. So immunocompromised transplant patients, 
um, long-term care residents. And there's a lot of work being done trying to characterize what protective immunity is, but tighter checks themselves probably aren't going to be the way where you go in and you get a tighter check and they tell you whether you afford know, those or not. It's more going to be directed at certain populations. Uh, does infection provide equal protection to a third dose of vaccine? That's a great question, and we don't really know. There's reasonable evidence that infection does not provide the same degree of protection as, as vaccination does. When you've already got two doses of vaccine and then you've got an infection, is that different? Quite possibly. Um, I think the general line that's kind of coming through right now is if, if you've had a couple doses and you've had an infection, it'd still be good to get your third dose, but you're deprioritized. It's not as important because you're probably, you know, you've had two point something doses. We still want you to get three, but you're better than two. Uh, I think this is one of the issues that's still kind of emerging. We're trying to sort it out. And a lot problem is a lot of these people that have been infected after having two doses, it's been fairly recent. Like there's a lot of people who are well protected, then we had emergence of Delta, and then now Omicron, which is the big issue. And it takes time to really get through those data. So a lot of this has really been accumulated in the last month or two. So we don't have a lot of good information on it yet. Um, the staff member that developed clinical signs of COVID January 8th, tested negative on the 9th, isolated, tested positive on the 12th. Uh, okay, so this is getting to the return to work. I'm gonna to come to that. So if I don't answer that well, uh, I'm gonna skip through the return to work questions because um, we're gonna hit that in a minute. For people who got Omicron in the past month, when should they get their booster? Yeah, so it basically, sorry, it's, it's like I said, it's kind of deprioritized, so you can wait longer. So kind of get to the end of the queue, get all the other people that haven't had their third dose or their vaccine or sorry, their infection done, and then we'll roll them out. But there's not a, a strict line on that yet. Um, what COVID variant is being tested for in here? Well, they're, they're testing for all of them. And information I haven't seen or has not been released for a lot of it, it was Delta in Quebec, which makes sense because that's what's in the human population. In the US, it's been strains that have been out there in the human population. So what we've seen from deer, what I've seen from deer is basically a direct representation of what's in human population at the time. Um, I'm not sure if or when we have the Ontario data, we'll see that. So presumably the Ontario will be data will be Delta because we're positive. They were sampled in November. I see Maureen had a comment there. Maybe she's gonna correct me, but I would guess they're gonna be Delta if the when the information comes out. Uh, since mucosal IgA is not stimulated by parenteral vaccines, should we be looking at more intranasal vaccines? So it's a great question, and you could probably argue a couple ways on this. And yes, people are looking at mucosal vaccines. There are a lot of mucosal vaccines being looked at. It might give us that better initial protection. Um, will mucosal vaccine, mucosal vaccines give us enough to protect against severe lower airway disease? Might be the other question. So if they can stem off infection drop the risk of infection, but if you get infected, you still have a high chance of getting severe respiratory disease, then it might be a bit of a trade-off. And ultimately you might be looking at combinations of parenteral and IN, because really we're worried about the severe systemic, severe pulmonary effects, uh, where we probably do want more systemic response, CMI and hemoral response. But yeah, mucosal vaccines certainly are something that's being looked at and for the needle phobic, they're a great thing. Um, so Maureen just saying, yeah, typing the deer variants is being done, but hasn't been released. So I'm just going to see, okay, the question about Omicron is how likely is it coming from a wildlife reservoir? So I think I meant to this last time, and actually what I said last time was there were two main theories people have been talking about for emergence of such a strange variant. Like it didn't just evolve, it came out of nowhere. So the two things we were talking about initially is with circulating in an area with little surveillance. So maybe circulating in sub-Saharan Africa without being detected. And it only got picked up when it hit South Africa, which has a very good surveillance program. So it was actually just evolving over time and we didn't realize it. Another possibility, which is less likely, was circulating in one person. So an immunocompromised person that couldn't clear the infection. So it's mutating over time as it's in that person for weeks or months, and then it gets kicked back into the human population. You know, by that point, I said, well, hey, what about the animal thing? I don't think it's very likely, but the other possibility is this went into animals. You know, lots of wildlife, maybe in Africa, uh, went into animals, mutated, and came back into people. So I said, probably less likely, probably much less likely than circulating in people, but you got to think it's a possibility. And the OIE in the last week or two has come out with something basically saying, yeah, it's a possibility. We don't know, but it's a possibility. And this is why we look at this stuff, right? I don't think it probably happened. 
But that's why we want to pay attention because there's a chance this could happen as it moves around the human through the animal population. Um, if a person is moderately immunocompromised based on meds, how do they determine whether the three shot protocol has resulted in a protective titer? It's a bit of a challenge. So if someone has early COVID, they sometimes will do antibody titers. So this is where titers come in to help de decide what to do therapeutically at times. So if you've got someone that's immunocompromised, they might just say, okay, we don't trust vaccination. You're going to get a monoclonal antibody and or an antiviral. Or they might say, yeah, you're probably okay, but let's look and see if you've got antibodies. Let's see what you're, so we can get an idea of whether you responded. It's not necessarily as much a protective titer, but an idea if you responded. So a lot of this stuff is being determined on the fly right now, quite honestly. Do we need a vaccine that's more optimized to Omicron? Uh, it'd be nice and it's being worked on. The problem is it takes time to develop the vaccine, to get it licensed, to get it rolled out. And by the time you do that, like if we did a Delta vaccine after Delta emerged, we'd maybe be rolling it out now if we were really, really fast, really, really lucky, and there's no Delta anymore. So that's one of the challenges of trying to keep up with strains. The bigger thought is whether we can really have a true pan SARS-CoV-2 or pan Sarbeco virus, that group vaccine that will cover all the variants. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pop into the testing stuff here. I'll come back to the questions. Um, I think some of them will relate to what we've got here, but I'll make sure we get to all the questions. Okay, so some of the challenges with Omicron, besides the fact that it's really bloody transmissible, it's among one of the one of the most transmissible viruses we've ever encountered. Uh, things we're dealing with in a practical component that relate to veterinary practice. Two of the big ones are isolation post-infection, so isolation period post-infection, and how and when to use rapid tests. And this last one, I think I understood, I thought I understood rapid tests a lot more last week than I do now. So take what I say with a bit of a grain of salt. So if we look at the guidance for isolation of infected people, it's emerged over, it's evolved over time. So, you know, 14 days after the onset of symptoms, that was dropped down to 10 days. And it's moved further. And really what we know is people tend to have high viral burdens right around the onset of disease. Before they're symptomatic within 24 hours, and the first couple of days is when they're pumping out the most virus, and that drops over time. But it can be variable. With PCR, you can find people people that have prolonged PCR positivity, but they're probably not infectious. They've got a low level of virus shedding that's very low risk for transmission, or they're shedding dead virus, which is being picked up by PCR, but obviously isn't a concern. So we've seen this, these guidelines evolve over time, um, both in duration and whether testing is required. The start, you know, with 14 days and a couple of negative PCR tests, which is really strict, and it's really gonna overcall some of the risk but we kind of swung the other direction. This came out of CDC, mainly in the US. And they came out with guidance that said, five days after the onset of symptoms or positive test, you can come out. And there were a bunch of provisos in there that people didn't really pay attention to, but if you've got improvement to the symptoms, you've got no fever with strict masking, use of strong control measures, which isn't often done, especially in the US. Um, and then later they walked it back a little bit and brought in some comments about testing. The problem with this, this is really designed more to get people back to work than it was to control an infectious virus. Because we know the number of people that will still have relatively high viral burdens at the point they're probably infectious is still quite high five days after the onset of the disease. So yeah, there'll be much, there'll be fewer people that'll be infectious, but it's that balance between they're trying to minimize the disruption. And what's going on in the U.S. is different than the situation in other areas based on the amount of control that's going on otherwise, right? If you're in a more controlled area, the more people you put out at day five that are infectious, the greater you screw things up, essentially. So the recommendations have largely moved to that five-day thing with all those provisos. And this is the thing to, to think about. So a couple of things to think about is, one, do you want that to happen, right? What is the relative importance of infection prevention versus getting someone back to work in your work case? or in your life? And how do we do these other things? The other thing that's just kind of come on the radar very recently for me is should vaccination status impact the return? So there is some data coming out now showing or suggesting at least that people that are vaccinated, they might have the same degree of viral burden if you sample their respiratory secretions, but they're less infective. So you know, for some reason, they are less able to transmit it. 
And whether that's because the virus is, you know, it's compromised, it's more, you know, it's been inactivated, it's being bound by antibodies, they're picking up viral remnants versus picking up active infectious virus. But there is some thought that people that are vaccinated might pose a bit of a lower risk than people that are unvaccinated, even at the same point with the same type of testing burden. This is pretty preliminary, but again, it just reinforces the importance of vaccination. So with back to this five day thing, I get asked about this like multiple times a day from clinics. And, and my general line is, you know, that is the absolute bare minimum. This is your El Cheapo program if you're trying to sketch on. Here's what we can do for your patient. If all you can afford is this much, we'll do the basic and we'll see what happens. We'll hope for the best. That's what this plan is. You know, the, the is cost not an issue? Let's do it right. It's not five days with testing. It's extended. There's five days. It's five days with testing or extending the duration. So treat as the bare minimum when the need to get to work is substantial. When testing can be done ideally, ideally testing at day five and day six, which means you're still stretching right up to day six. And when you've got enhanced practices. So if you're gonna have someone come back in the clinic or you're gonna go back in the clinic on day five, I want at least a test on day five. I really want two tests. Uh, and you wanna enhance your masking game. So N95, KN95, FFP2, a, a better mask than a you know baggy surgical medical mask. You need to maximize distancing, maximize ventilation, and no mask free time in the clinic. What I don't want to do is have someone out in day five and they're in the lunchroom hanging out for a half hour on a coffee break and they leave and then someone comes in there next or someone's in there trying to stay distance, but we got one person unmasked who has a high chance, you know, higher chance of being infectious. So we want to really clamp down on all these fairly routine practices if we're going to push that window. So my recommendation is if you can do it, don't rush people back on day five. If you want to get them back quickly, you know, rapid test day five, rapid test day six, with a lot of the provisos, like I to mention in a couple of minutes about rapid tests, ideally stretch it out to 10 days. If it's not disruptive, isolate for 10 days is, is really a safer response. Okay, so rapid tests, um, I won't go over this much because I've shown it before, but rapid tests have a defined use, right? Rapid tests have a, have a fairly high threshold of detection. You've got a fair bit of virus there before you get a positive. And that can be a good thing because, you know, essentially at the point where with the older strains, at least, once you're rapid test positive, you're getting at the level where you're probably infectious because you can have a reasonable bit of virus in your respiratory tract and not pose a transmission risk. So we got a lot of people that are PCR positive with low viral burdens and their antigen test negative, but that antigen test really tells us more about their infectivity and the risk to others. So the antigen test of a narrow window, higher threshold before they're positive, and that can be useful for a control measure when you're in an endemic state or still an epidemic state. Now, the question is, how good is it with the different variants? So overall, rapid testing really is best for asymptomatic individuals um, because the symptomatic individuals, when you're in the middle of a situation like we are right now, assume they've got COVID. If you've got someone that has COVID-like signs right now and they have a negative rapid test, I would say they have COVID. Repeat the test because it'll probably be positive later on. Yeah, there's influenza. Yeah, there are other things out there, but the odds of it being COVID are so high that you know, we don't want to rely on this to let sick people do things because it's, the predictive value is not very good. Uh, like I said, lower sensitive than PCR, but that should be fine in most situations if we're worried about infectious individuals. Uh, what the challenge is, the sensitivity of these seems to be lower with Omicron for two different issues. One is just the inherent sensitivity of the test, and the other is the sample type. So it's really changed a lot. The, the provincial science table yesterday, we were talking about rapid tests a lot. And there, there is going to be an Ontario science table brief on rapid tests probably fairly soon because we figured we really need one. But what to say is, is the challenge because there's a lot of information coming out right now that's confusing us. Um, you know, we're seeing some mixed information. We're seeing some information that with some tests, the ability to detect Omicron is lower. So again, a negative rapid test in a symptomatic person in the Omicron era is even less convincing that this person is not infectious. A positive, yeah. So they're very specific tests. If you get a positive, okay, that person's of concern. So a sample type, this is something that we're kind of paying a lot more attention to right now. So Omicron seems to be less of a virus of the nasal passages and more of, the vir more of a virus of you know, the pharynx. Um, if you compare saliva to nasal swabs, it looks like saliva is going to be superior, maybe quite superior to nasal swabs. 
which is the opposite for Delta and the opposite for the other strains that we've had. And most of the rapid testing we do is, is marketed, labeled as a nasal swab test. So we're seeing some messaging changing and we're debating about changing some messaging as well about how to do this. Do we do two tests? Do you do an oral test? Do you do a nasal test? Do you do a pooled sample where you stick it in your throat first and then stick it up your nose, which some people don't really like? Um, or do you do just a saliva test, assuming that it's at least as good, if not better than a nasal swab when we're in a situation where it's basically guaranteed to be Omicron. So oral swabs or paired oral nasal swabs probably increase the rapid test sensitivity. So just something to think about as we're using the swabs, it's, it's going off label for them, but uh, it's probably gonna increase the sensitivity. So how do we use rapid tests? I'm not gonna go over all this, I've done it before, but there are a lot of different situations we can use them. And we don't really know how to use them. And I think we're, we're no less now than we did a couple of weeks ago. So essentially what we know about rapid tests is if you've got a positive, you can be very confident in that. If you've got a negative in a low risk person, the predictive value is pretty good. It's in between is a bit of a challenge. So a single negative in a high risk situation isn't all that convincing. And right now, you know, we've got to assume we're in a higher risk situation just because of the state of the pandemic we're in. So if you've got someone that's got very little exposure, right, someone who's doing a very good job staying isolated, and they've got a negative test, it's pretty good. But if you've got someone that's out and, out and about and, you know, meeting a lot of people, then their pretest suspicion goes up. So a negative test gets, gets less and less convincing. There was a lot of testing done over Christmas, right? And we did it too. So before you go see the grandparents, have everyone do a rapid test. And if they're negative, then you're good. Um, like, you know, the more people that do it, the better a single negative test. You get a whole family and, and the one kid does the negative test. I think it's good if it's negative, but it doesn't give you a lot of confidence. Serial testing or testing of populations, if you're more. So if you test that individual a few days in a row, you get more and more confidence. Or if you test a whole group of them, if you test your whole family versus just the kids, your confidence goes up. So I mean, my take home there is single sporadic testing is getting less convincing. Uh, it's lower yield. I'm not saying it's bad, but it's lower yield. And you just can't have as much confidence, especially if someone's at high risk exposure, especially if someone is sick. So as the sensitivity decreases because of the strain or the timing of infection, for exposure or the sample type, the predictive values will, will, will switch a little bit. So it compromises that. Let's do a single test right now and say we're good to go because I've had some high risk event or we're gonna do testing every week or every two weeks. You say it's not gonna be bad because if you pick it a positive, then you pick that person out, you isolate them. It shouldn't give you as much confidence to say, let's do a high risk thing. So, you know, I'm gonna go something I'm gonna do I mean, it's something, you know, that I know is kind of dumb. I'm going to go mix in a large group without masks. And then three days later, I'm going to do a rapid test because I'm going to be in a higher situation. No, we don't want that because we can't be as comfortable that rapid test is going to be representative. So hopefully that makes sense. And I kind of rambled on a little bit. So they're still useful. Don't try to use a single rapid test to rule it out, especially in a high risk situation. Serial testing will tell you more. One of the problems is we just don't have a lot of tests. So for clinics that have kind of been doing, you know, once weekly testing or something like that, you know, the message I've had, I guess, for the last few weeks is think about targeting your testing more because you're going to burn through your tests pretty quickly and then you may not have them when you need them because we want to get more intensive testing if we really need to sort out a problem. So instead of doing one, once weekly testing, if you have a relatively limited supply, let's hold off, let's do a targeted approach. So if someone's sick, if someone's exposed, and then they can get multiple tests in a row as opposed to let's just do sporadic testing over time when it's lower yield. So think about targeted testing. If you have rapid tests, think about stockpiling your tests for situations where the pretest likelihood is higher because someone's been previously ill, they've had an exposure that we're worried about, then we can get into serial testing and have a bit more confidence in the results. So a positive is a positive. Initially, the, the messaging was if it's positive, send them off for PCR testing. Um, you know, as PCR testing access goes down, it's basically saying, okay, you can either report it as a positive to someone. So we collect the numbers and just skip the confirmatory test or more likely what happens is people just say, okay, I've got COVID, off I go. No one's ever gonna find out about it, not gonna report it, but I'm gonna assume I have COVID. So if you have a positive rapid test, assume you're infected. And then your clock for your isolation period would start with that first test or when you started to feel sick 
whichever is earlier. If you're negative and you're asymptomatic, you're lower risk right now. If I'm negative right now, it doesn't mean I'm negative this afternoon or tonight or tomorrow. It means I'm pretty low risk for that. If I'm symptomatic and I'm negative, still assume you got COVID, like I've said a bunch of times. And the other thing is just as we learn more and more about testing not being a great tool, testing isn't per se an infection control tool. It's a surveillance tool at heart that we can use in some targeted control things, but it's not a strong control tool. Vaccination is a stronger control tool. And this is why we've seen the movement from, okay, if you're not vaccinated, you have to do a rapid test to if you're not vaccinated, you don't go, right? You don't go to this venue or whatever. Not Rapid tests are not a replacement for vaccination. I think everyone's probably pretty clear on that, but it's just another messaging point when it comes to vaccination and rapid testing. Okay, I'm gonna pop back into questions if I can see where I was. Uh, I got a couple more things after this, but this is the bulk of it. Sorry, let me see what we got here. And if I've missed the question, um, don't be afraid to toss it in again. So, uh, splenectomized individuals were initially on a high risk list. Doesn't seem to be now. Why any insight in that change? A lot of it is just trying to make sure the highest risk immunocompromised peoples get prioritized. If you throw a really broad net saying all of these groups are immunocompromised, then you, you bung up the system and getting fourth doses, right? You want to make sure that the really high risk ones get their fourth doses. And then you worry about that less high risk later on. So the splenectomized individuals aren't going to be quite as high risk as a lot of the other immunocompromised people. So that would be my guess. That's the guess. Uh, is there any science to say that infection with COVID creates longer duration immunity than fully vaccinated? Well, the, the science that we have so far would say that uh, vaccination provides better protection than infection. Reinfection is very common. If you look at Omicron, um, in South Africa, where it first emerged, it was pretty much assumed everyone had been infected at least once already. They had a high baseline exposure and immunity rate and rampant transmission. So um, vaccination... The data that are out there in general would show that vaccination is better than natural infection. Natural infection will obviously give you some protection, but you're not getting a natural infection in your way out of this. You can't say Omicron's going to burn through everyone and we're going to be good. There are enough people that are getting multiple infections. Um, that That's pretty clear. It's not the case. Uh, how long would you wait to allow a child under 11 to be exposed after two vaccines? Well, I assume you mean like doing something that's higher risk exposure. Um, you know, typically, you know, you say 14 to 28 days after vaccination is really when we start thinking about the being protected. With second doses, you get a fairly quick response. So, uh, sort of expansion of the question there. When would you be comfortable putting them into a higher risk school room? You know, I think if you wanted to be conservative, two to four weeks after the second dose, you can be fairly comfortable. They've got a good protective immunity from their two doses. And, and kids do seem to respond well to two doses. We still want to get third doses into them ultimately, but the degree of protection of kids to two doses seems to be better than what we get with adults to two doses. Again, it's not, not the strongest data on that, but from what I've seen, I think that's fair. Uh, comment on masking, I'll get the masks in a second. Uh, isolate for 10 days from the onset of signs or the first positive tests. Yes, whatever is earliest. So once you have onset of clinical signs or a positive test, you know that you are infectious and that's when your window starts. If someone got COVID with three vaccines, what symptoms would they have? Usually if you got three vaccines and you've got COVID, it's mild disease, mild or asymptomatic disease if you're immunocompetent. And then we're still fairly early into the three dose era here in, in Israel, they're a lot longer into that. And they've seen you know, lots of cases, but don't tend to see severe disease. So if you get a breakthrough infection, you're going to have the same type of you know, mild infection. Typically, you're not going to have as much chance of it becoming severe. Um, I heard infection with Delta after two vaccines would be a single symptom. No, usually it's, it's just going to be a milder form. The other thing is that Omicron is a bit different than Delta. Omicron has moved away from some of the classic la loss of smell a loss of taste. You don't tend to see that much with Omicron. Omicron also pre presents with things that are more general that we don't see with the other variants like myalgia. Uh, sometimes just back pain has been kind of the initial sign. So in general, that whole gamut of influenza-like illnesses, but 
Omicron has fewer of those kind of what we have associated with COVID, the loss of taste and smell in particular, and some more general signs. Um, oral swabbing, do you mean touching the tonsils or just the saliva? So oral swabbing typically is just going, not going back and trying to do a, a pharyngeal swab. Usually it's just kind of a deep, deep cheek, back of the tongue swab. I haven't seen any real comparisons of different oral types of swabs, but usually like saliva is a good composite of all that. So essentially you're just getting a good saliva swab. If someone sucked on the swab for a second, it'd probably be about the same. Yeah, so you don't need to go all the way back in and make yourself gag. Um, developments in the area of contact tracing. Well, the big development is we're not really doing any. Um, so given we don't, none of us access to the phone technology, despite this limitation, is there any update on its role? Well, contact tracing would still be very important. If we could do it, we just can't. There are just too many people. And now that we're not testing, it's useless to a large degree. Contact tracing is really focused on high risk situations where you've got kind of public type events where you might need to follow up on workplaces, restaurants, you know, theaters and things like that, where you might have a big broad exposure. So contact tracing, the ability of contact tracing to do something decreases as you get more and more cases. Because as you get more and more cases, you know there's a lot more undiagnosed disease out there. Contact tracing only works on the cases you know about. So when you're early and you know that the cases you know about are a big chunk of the cases that are there, contact tracing can be more useful. Once it's so widespread, contact tracing is not going to help you as much. Uh, if a coworker is testing positive, even though it's been 11 days, how do you handle that? So this would depend on what you mean by testing positive. If it's PCR, I wouldn't care. If it's rapid test, I'd rather not have them in the building. Just because the cutoff for rapid tests is still fairly high with the viral burden that's there. And I'd be worried that they'd be infectious. Um, we don't typically see people being rapid test positive for that long. Um, certainly you can see them, you know, between the five and eight days, 11 would be extreme, but it's possible. So if you got someone that's positive on a rapid test, I would consider them infectious. Just they're an outlier. And uh, I would keep testing, you know, if you have a test, I would keep doing it daily. And once they become negative, ideally two negatives before we got them back. You know, if they're day 14 and they're negative, they're probably pretty low risk. Uh, how predictive is a positive result for a rapid test if you're symptomatic? It's very good. Like if you get a positive result, you're symptomatic, you have COVID basically full stop. If you have a negative test and you're symptomatic, you still probably have COVID. But if you have a positive test, it's gonna be 99, probably whatever percent predictive value. Uh, I think we covered the swabbing side. So if rapid test is negative, you still want to get a PCR test after you've been positive. So if you've done your isolation period and you've done a test at five days, 10 days, whatever, and your rapid test is negative, do you do a PCR test? Well, probably not, because the PCR test isn't going to change what you do, because a negative PCR, you know, it makes you feel better. A positive PCR and a negative rapid test at an appropriate isolation time is going to be low risk for someone being infectious because we can see PCR positivity that stretches when people have that quite low viral burden. Uh, I'll do a couple more, then I'll maybe hit, I think masks might be the last thing that I have. So if we have <laughs> misfortune of an unvaccinated staff member, testing her twice weekly, having read outside the clinic, eat outside the clinic, um, continue going forward, have a rapid test, you can swab them out the nose. So yeah, if you've got someone that, you can't get vaccinated for whatever reason. Um, you know, the rapid testing twice a week isn't going to hurt. It's going to help. It's not a guarantee. You just have to realize that person still is going to pose more risk and probably much more risk than a vaccinated person in the clinic, right? So you have to decide what risk you're going to accept. And, you know, bringing in rapid testing is going to help. The more you do it, the better. So twice a week is better than once a week. I would seriously consider doing a mouth and nose swab if you can get them to do it. Um, if not, I would even just consider doing a, a mouth swab based on what we're learning at this point. Um, or no more testing. Well, no more testing, you know, it comes down to, do you have enough tests? Like if you only have a handful of tests and you think you need them in case someone's exposed or you want to do some tests to return after the isolation period because you will burn through a lot of tests and you're not going to be able to find any new ones for the next few weeks so i think it comes down to your test supply if you have enough tests i would still keep doing it 
um, because then it gives you a little bit of protection. You just have to realize that it's not giving you absolute protection. The person's high risk and you still want to do other things. Like I would want that person to be wearing an N95. I wouldn't want them to have the mask off in the clinic at all and things like that. Um, so let's see. Lost my ability to scroll. There we go. Um, why are we not seeing Delta anymore? Just Omicron is so bloody good. Uh, we see this with the really infectious variants, like Delta kicked out Alpha, Alpha kicked out wild type. So the new variants that are highly transmissible just end up taking over. I think that's just a matter of greater transmission rate. We didn't see, we were wondering whether we might see kind of a dueling Omicron Delta thing going on. And really Omicron has largely displaced Delta and in some places probably completely displaced it. What about lunch breaks? Um, yeah, ideal. a lot of this comes down to logistics and knowing your staff, right? What's the risk status of people for severe disease? What's everyone's three vaccine status? What's the risk status of people in their households? Do they have even compromised people at home? What's kind of the behavioral status? If you know some of your, some of your staff really are done, right? And they're going to group events, they're going to parties and they're not doing very good protocols outside then I'd be more wary of doing it. Uh, a lot of it comes down to, you know, it's, it's cost benefit. It's that Swiss cheese approach to control. We layer on as much as we can. If we remove something, we try to beef up the other. So based on just the need to operate the clinic, based on your clinic design, based on the weather and on all of these things, if you think you need to have people in the same room for breaks, then you, you try to layer on some other protections, bring in a HEPA filter. They're pretty easy to get, they're fairly cheap. You minimize the time. You kind of make it clear that your mask is off when you're eating, but when you're kind of sitting back, relaxing after after eating, then try to put your mask back on. If you're on a coffee break, you can do the lift up the mask and drink thing. It's a bit annoying, but it's not that hard to do. So I think you try to find balances. Perfect world, you wouldn't have them in the break room unmasked. Um, and even if you had people in the break room unmasked one at a time, it would still be good to have a HEPA filter in there because this virus can remain suspended in the air for a little while. So you have to really pick what, which works best for your clinic. It's a bit of a vague answer, but I think it's probably the, the real one right now. Uh, if unvaccinated people have been exposed to a positive person, how long should they isolate? Now this guidance really depends on where you are because it, it's different region to region and it's changing a little bit. Initially, we the pretty much the standard line was 14 days. So that builds in an incubation period and then your 10 days if you happen to have been infected. Um, that's been cut back in some areas and it really depends on your region. So you have to look at your local public health unit, but most places I think now would still be 10 days isolation. Um, the negative, rapid test negative on day two of Omicron symptoms and PCR negative on day three. Is it still Omicron? Um, probably not. Like if you've got it, once you're getting into days two and three uh, being symptomatic, I would be suspicious that it's something else. And with a negative PCR, most guidelines are going to spring you based on, if it's an appropriately timed negative PCR. And by day three of symptoms, day three of after exposure, I'd say no. Day three of symptoms, you got two negative tests. One of them being PCR, I'd say you probably don't have COVID. Um, so you might be the exception to the rule of if you're sick, you have COVID. Uh, have unvaccinated staff and almost at a rapid test. How do we get more? That's the challenge, right? Getting rapid tests. I'm not sure how we're getting these federally provided tests rolled out. It's just, they're hard to find. Everyone wants them. Um, so that's why I've been saying stockpile tests. You have target them for your higher risk situations. How do we deal with unvaccinated staff? <laughs> That's the standard question is like, you can, you can mandate it. Right? And you can also do things that make it, you know, you're not punishing them per se, but you know, you can't have your mask off at all. You have to wear an NF5. You can bring in enough, you can layer on enough extra protections that are completely logical and completely fair, but might be enough to get the incentive. Um, ultimately, you have to decide whether you're gonna mandate it. Some places will. Um, and it's been challenged in human healthcare, and they've lost every time they challenged. So the mandates, the vaccine mandates, have, have have hung, have stood up to healthcare. They've stood up in transit. They've stood up in other areas. So there is a lot of precedent. A lot of it comes down to the staff dynamic too. So what I, you know, mainly start with education, trying to figure out why they're unvaccinated. And if they're a hardcore anti-vaxxer who's bought into the crap on the internet, you'll probably save your talking for later because you're not going to convert them. 
if they just, you know, they're confused, they've read some stupid things, this is where the education component, we might be able to get them persuaded to do it. And just realizing that, you know, if they're unvaccinated, they're not gonna be doing a lot of stuff for a long time. Like we're not dropping vaccine requirements to go into, you know, the theaters and sporting events and restaurants for a long time, probably. You look at Quebec when they brought in vaccine requirements to, to buy, you know, cannabis or booze that brought up their vaccination rates. So, you know, there are these little things that are driving more vaccination. Okay, I'm gonna pop back to masks for a minute. And then I'll get back to the questions. I know we got a pile there. I'll stick around as late as we need answering questions. Really quick on masks. Um, we have to up our mask game because this is a more transmissible variant. Um, you know, any mask is good. A cloth mask is better than nothing, but a cloth mask isn't very good. Cloth masks are archaic, really, when it comes to COVID control. They were good for droplet-driven transmission, which we saw with the original one. As we see more and more evidence of true airborne aerosol transmission, we need to increase where we are. So at a minimum, you know, the medical style masks, whether they're non-medical masks or medical masks, they're better than cloth. They're easy to get, they're cheap. Um, you know, they're baggy. So you're gonna get stuff blowing around the sides. They're not optimal for this, um, but they're better than cloth. So for me, what I'd say is cloth masks, don't use them. We should be getting rid of them. We can get access to medical style masks. Whether it's a medical or non-medical mask, you know, ideally we have a medical mask because medical mask comes, you know, to fit a certain spec and with quality control and manufacturing rigor. A lot of the non-medical masks are basically the same thing. They just haven't hit those bars or they haven't been tested to those bars. They've been produced just to be a non-medical mask to save from having to do that. But they've got the same materials and same manufacturing. You're just more confident with a medical mask than a non-medical mask. Um, I'm fine using non-medical masks because, you know, it can be harder to find medical masks still. So I think the hierarchy really comes down to the non-medical, then medical, and then we've got our better filtration masks, which still can be non-medical or medical. I've got non-medical KN95s, and these are perfectly fine KN95s. They just aren't marketed for medical use, and they aren't tested through that spec. So I think we should be trying to get N95, KN95, FFP2, the higher filtration masks in wherever we go. I wear a KN95. Um, most of the ones I have are non-medical, you know, I just buy a KN95 when I can buy one. If it's medical, great. If it's non-medical, I don't really care. I have my medical fit test, fit tested N95s if I'm going into a household to sample an animal uh, when people have COVID. But for my routine things, I wear a KN95. I fight with my kids to get them work to wear a KN95 because they like the medical mask better. But the big thing is if we can get rid of cloth, that's a good start. If we can emphasize the use of N95, KN95. At our hospital, though, we see we've moved towards KN95s, trying to get everyone wearing them, just because of the added degree of protection, the higher risk environment. And one of the big selling points, I think, for compliance is the implications of an outbreak. You know, we shut down care that can't be provided very, very well in other places. So between all those factors, we get pretty good compliance. So think about upgrading your masks if you're not using an N95, K95 right now. Uh, the question I just saw come in there, that was, I was gonna say anyway, how often can you wear them? So they're marketed as single use. We know we can use them more. CDC has said you know, conservatively five different uses. General line is 40 hours is probably fine. Realistically, the straps are gonna break before the filtration runs into a problem, if you handle them well. Like if you crumple them up, put them in your pocket, um, yeah, you might be creating little tears that you can't tell that are gonna impact filtration. If you're careful with the mask and it looks fine, uh, you can wear them for a week quite easily in a normal situation and not worry about it. And that helps you know, conserve costs and just some of the access issues. So don't be afraid to wear them for a week, just take care of them. Uh, and I think for mine, the main issue I've seen with my KN95s is I break the I break the strap before I get any concern about the integrity of the mask. So I guess for, this is kind of a standard slide, but it really comes for us in clinics thinking about focusing on vaccination, right? Trying to get everyone vaccinated, trying to get three doses and facilitating that. We didn't talk about ventilation because I've harped on it a lot, but improving ventilation, right? Monitoring your ventilation with a CO2 monitor bringing in HEPA filters in high-risk areas, reducing numbers in the clinic. Still, we want fewer numbers of people in there, you know, overall, but at any one time in any one space to distribute and reduce the risk. Still try to distance as much as we can. We can't do it all the time, obviously, but, you know, distance when we can and continue good use of PPE. 
So I think we're about out of time. And if you wanted to, to, to wrap up anything, like, I'm like I said, I'm happy to stick around and try to get through all the questions. And uh, did you want to jump in? And Well, thank you. Um, I think that it's wonderful if you're able to stay. And so um, I thank everybody for coming today. But let's just keep on going. If you need to leave, you leave. And otherwise, we'll wrap up when the question is done. Okay, Scott, appreciate that. That's great. Yeah. So thanks for tuning in, everyone. If you're going to leave, don't be afraid to leave. you got other things to do. Um, if, like I said, if I missed the question, toss it back in. I'm going to try to make sure I probably skipped over some. Um, do you recommend mandatory vaccine policies for clinics where it's almost impossible to, for, to socially distance? Well, in every clinic, it's impossible to properly distance. And distancing, you know, just when you got a really transmissible airborne aerosol virus, distancing is only part of the thing. Like if you're putting a catheter in someone, if you're standing in an OR with someone, like, you know, you're getting close contact. So clinics are a high risk environment, which is why we've seen a lot of clinics with outbreaks. You know, it's been quite common and we've seen you know, another rash of them now that Omicron has kicked in. So I think, you know, I'm going to err towards the side of being more aggressive with vaccination because I do infectious diseases. The lawyers are going to err towards the side of being a little more cautious because they're trying to protect you legally. Um, I'm a completely non-legally minded person. I would say that I think you can do it, bring in requirements um, because it's been tested very well. A lot of the issue is you might lose staff. So yeah, it's a cost benefit. So I think education is really the key. Try to figure out why they aren't going to get vaccinated. And don't be afraid to kick people my way. Like I get, I talk to a lot of people like that. And if I have time, I'm happy to talk to people, figure out why they're worried about it. Figure out what motivates them. Maybe it's protecting patients. Maybe it's protecting their health. Maybe it's protecting your health or your family member's health. They haven't thought about it. Um, maybe it's you know thinking about all the other things that they can't do. So I think that's the easiest way to start. And then if that doesn't work, you have to think about whether you're willing to you know bring in the hammer, which is we're going to bring in a vaccine requirement and give people enough notice to get vaccinated. Be fair, but I don't think it's unreasonable. Again, because we are seeing a lot of clinics and you know we have we got not really good data but I, i've seen some data from the us the number of veterinarians that have died from probably back or clinic acquired infections and it's not a good number um as herd immunity is hopefully rising what's the realistic risk of a new variant developing out of omicron um how precisely can it be forecast i'm just letting a whining dog out of my room here but um we are going to see a new variant it's are we to see a bad one? Is Omicron as bad as we can get? Or have we got something else waiting in the wings? Um, you know, variants emerge because of transmission. And we have a substantial part of the world that's not vaccinated. And we still have enough people here. Like the more transmission, the more variant emerges. We can get emerges in Ontario right now. So we have so many people that they're still susceptible to infection, especially if we think we need three doses to really cut down that transmission. So we have no idea, like Omicron came out of nowhere, Delta came out of nowhere. I remember the summer saying, okay, we're in pretty good shape after wave three, you know, I think we're gonna see a wave four, like a little wave four, and that's probably gonna be the end of it. You know, I was right about the little wave four and I was completely wrong about, there's not gonna be a wave five. So until we vaccinate the world, we are gonna be at constant risk of emergence. We've got billions of people that haven't been vaccinated or been fully vaccinated. So we have to vaccinate ourselves, and we also have to help vaccinate the planet because you know Omicron may have emerged in Africa. We don't know if it did or not, but you know we're going to see variants come out of low vaccine coverage populations, and we're not going to have complete vaccine coverage for a while. The question will be: Will we see a significant variant? Like the, the issue with Delta, like Alpha, Delta, Omicron, is you're getting more and more transmissible. Can this sucker get any more transmissible, or is it tapped out now? That's one of the questions. Can you get a true vaccine escape mutant or one that really doesn't respond well to vaccine is another question. Antibody-based therapies are the things we're gonna lose most because that's the easiest thing for the virus to evade when it, when it changes. So we are gonna to have to deal with new variants. It's the question is, is it gonna change what we do? If it just means we need to keep vaccinating because you know it changes the dynamic a little bit, but we still have good protection with vaccination, then we just have to buy more time to vaccinate. But the longer we go without getting good protection, the greater chance we have of something nasty, nastier coming out. Is there a way to forecast it? No, it's a random event, right? Mutations happen all the time. You got to have the right combination of mutation and it's got to find a susceptible host and a population where there's enough susceptible host to keep spreading and it's got to go from there. So you can model it, but I'm not sure how well we can model it. Uh, Comment on simultaneous variant infections or COVID plus infection. 
It's a good question. We haven't really seen, because this has really gone wave to wave, it's, you know, it went to Alpha, then it went to Delta, then it went to Omicron. Um, I don't think we know much, or I don't know much about concurrent infections, and certainly people have had presumably Delta and Omicron at the same time. Uh, does it make it worse? I don't know. Um, COVID plus influenza has been the concern. Our flu rates have been really low. They're higher this year than they were in the past because we're opening up more. Um, but, you know, layering two different respiratory viruses that, two do, that can do two somewhat different things isn't ideal. So that's, again, another importance of, of flu vaccination to help prevent or reduce the risk of, of those combination infections. Uh, guidance for a good HEPA filter. Like, the HEPA filter, I have a HEPA filter. Um, I got it when we were still practicing with the hockey team, the girls' hockey team. So we put it in the dressing room just because dressing rooms and arenas are just crap ventilation. Um, we also use it in a couple of different places, but you know, it's just a Canadian tire HEPA filter. You find one that's, you know, it's true HEPA filter and it's rated for the size of room or oversize it. It's always bigger to go better. There's nothing really fancy you need. So they're still fairly easy to access. You just want one. Like what I say is buy one from a reputable manufacturer I, for HEPA filters, CO2 monitors. I'd rather not find something on Amazon that might be some knockoff. From a company I know nothing about. So if you're buying one, I think Honeywell is maybe the one I've got. You know, if you're buying buying a HEPA filter from a company that makes, you know, their history and their business is making this type of thing, I'd be fairly confident in it. Same thing with CO2 monitors. If you can find the company actually exists somewhere on the internet and they make monitors, then I'd be quite comfortable versus it's some knockoff that may or may not work. Um are you allowed to ask someone their vaccination status? You can ask, right? You can ask anything. Um, and I think it's very easy now because asking vaccination status is a standard for a lot of areas. And I'd have to see what, if there are any restrictions on that, but you know, you have to get asked your vaccination status to go to a restaurant to go on X, Y, and Z. So I, I certainly don't think it's an unfair question. If someone says no, they're probably says no, they don't want to say, then odds are they're not vaccinated. Um, probably have to see what the rules are in the province though about that. Is herd immunity a, a misnomer? Um, yeah, herd immunity is, the concept makes sense, right? Herd immunity means when you've got enough pe people that are protected, the infection dies out because you don't, your average infected person doesn't encounter another susceptible person. So herd immunity is based on immunity. It's not based on natural infection. It's based on, do you have susceptible individuals there? And that could be natural infection and that could be vaccination. And it's not as binary as that. You don't have people that are susceptible and people that are aren't. And people that aren't susceptible are not susceptible ever because it, it changes over time. I think the, the problem with herd immunity concept is people assume that, okay, if everyone gets infected with, with SARS-CoV-2 or with Omicron in particular, then we're good. The problem is you don't get lifelong protection. So if you don't get lifelong protection, you don't get to that herd immunity concept because you've still got a susceptible individual. So the principle is still there. It's just not as clear, I think, as it was maybe advertised at the start. Um, and the, the comment it implies that being vaccinated protects someone else from infection. So you're kind of getting two issues there from that one. So there's, do you get infected? Your vac does vaccination prevent you from getting infected and prevent you from transmitting the virus? So vaccination, like I said, it's not binary. You're not protected or you're not. You get degree degrees of that. If you're vaccinated, you're you're less likely to get infected. And if you're less, if you're not infected, you're not infectious. You're not transmitting it. If you're vaccinated and you get infected, it may reduce your risk of transmitting it compared to an uninfected, unvaccinated person that's infected. So there are a couple layers of protection from vaccination, but right, it's not absolute because we have a lot of infected people that can still get you know, a mild infection and still transmit the virus. So again, it's just, it, it's not binary, right? We can't, it's not as clean as you'd like to say, you get exposed, you get infected, now you're permanently immune and you can't affect anyone else. There are a lot of little nuances there. Uh, would the virus survive for a long time on a mask? We don't know kind of actual survival time. It's not a virus that's designed to live a long time in the environment. You can pick it up by PCR, but it's not necessarily a viable virus. Um, if you've got virus on your mask, um, we don't really worry about it that much. If you're not sharing the mask. Like if you're infected and you're wearing a mask and then someone else sticks their mask on, then yeah, you're getting exposed to virus there. We're not as worried about people 
having, you know, you're in an airspace, you go to the grocery store and you're wearing your mask. And we're not worried about getting significant viral burdens on the outside of that mask. So you take the mask off and you contaminate yourself. Really where that's a concern is in healthcare, where you've got someone that you've got a patient with COVID and you're intubating them, or you're doing something where you're right in their face. And that's when you probably have a face shield on anyway, but you're in a high risk environment. There's a lot of virus coming out there because there's an infectious burden. So from normal use in community circumstances, you're really not worried about a significant viral load being there. If the virus does get on there, does it get on there? You know, certainly could survive a few hours, maybe longer. Um, I don't think we know that very well because to really identify it, you have to culture it to see if it's infectious as opposed to seeing if it's there by, by PCR. Uh, UV light. So UVC, UVC will disinfect air. Um, you can buy portable UVC units. They're, they probably work fairly well. Like HEPA is tried and true. We know how to maintain it. Uh, UVC, you can buy similar types of things. So they've got to circulate the air through the UVC. You can get UVC systems where you put them in and you evacuate the room and you turn it on, you know, flashes around and, and kills things on surfaces. That's probably not very useful because we're not worried about surfaces. You can put UVC systems in ductwork as well. And we're not, you know, not really as high on that because I'm not worried about this getting the ductwork and spreading room to room. You know, theoretically it can. There have been some instances when it probably happened, but it's pretty low yield. So a UVC unit in the room, just like a HEPA filter in a room, is probably going to be fairly equivalent. HEPA is just tried and true and easy to maintain, and we know a lot more about it. Um, so people had two AZ vaccines and one mRNA vaccine get a fourth vaccine. I think right now, still the approach is if you got your mRNA vaccine, you're good to go. You're equivalent to three doses. Um, cause that AZ mRNA vaccination still seems to be a really good combination. Um, so someone that got one or two AZs followed by mRNA still might be in as good or better shape than someone that got all mRNA vaccines. So we're, we're prioritizing people getting that third dose if they had two AZs because we know it wasn't as effective. Um, but that third dose really does seem to kick up. For Omicron, I don't think we have much data on that. And that's something that you might see change, but someone that's had two AZs and a mRNA vaccine, you might say, okay, we'd rather, if we're gonna do fourth doses, you're gonna be higher priority, but you're still gonna be at the bottom of the queue behind the immunocompromised and the old and all these others. So you might be ahead of some people, but you're still pretty low on the list. This is evolving stuff though, as fourth doses get, get presented. So I wouldn't be worried about it. It wouldn't be something to be high on my list to get done. Uh, I guess another question about duration of masks. I think I already covered that. How long should you wear a mask before replacing it? So the two issues, one is time and one is just the status of the mask. So if you're crumbling, if you're, if you see visible tears, creases, things like that, ditch it. Um, if you're handling it carefully, I'm fine with a week. And you know, that that's fairly consistent guidance that we're getting out there now. The more you take it on and off, the more you risk damaging it, but really the more risk you, you risk damaging the strap. And obviously when the strap goes, you're done. So I, I think we can quite easily get away with a, with a week. I know I rapid fired through a lot of that. So I think maybe a little bit fast, but um, I think, well, the last question was medical grade, not N95. We basically say the same line for the N95s versus the medical masks in terms of duration. So handle them carefully. Uh, with none of those masks, are we really worried about filtration running in? So like if, if you're using an N95 for drywall, like you will run into filtration issues, right? It's gonna get gummed up and you're gonna have a hard time breathing. Um, but we're not gonna see that with this type of filtration. You're not gonna damage the filtration ability just by using it for a few days or a week. You're gonna affect its ability to work by damaging the mask physically by how you handle it. So any of those masks are fine. The medical masks are a little bit more prone, I think, to being squished up and being creased because they're flimsier. The N95s that kind of come the duck mask, you can kind of fold them right back together and they're easy to keep. The medical mass, if you fold them up, then you're creating a, a crease. So the M95, the medical mass, you kind of want to lay flat. But if you're doing that and handling them well, a week is still fine. Okay, uh, I think we're good there. Are three ply mat cloth masks okay? I would say not really. They're better than one or two ply cloth masks, but they're not anything I'd want to wear at this point. Considering we can find medical or non medical masks, I would ditch cloth. Full stop.
All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Ruiz, for your time and information, and thanks for all participants for joining today. Keep your eyes out on the email for future emails from CVMA regarding upcoming town hall webinars. And I'd just like to say in our ongoing and frustrating and tiring pandemic, I wish us all to be brave, brave enough to be kind at all times, and wish each of you a very good day. Thank you.